This is episode two of Real Shift Radio with guest Rosie Tran. Are you ready for the shift? Are you ready for security, balance, and freedom to do the things that you want to do? It all starts with the shift. My name is Dominic Labriola. I'm a real estate broker and developer, and each week I sit down to speak with the most inspiring people in the real estate industry to bring you stories of shift, successes, challenges, aha moments, and overall best practices to help you live your best life. This is Real Shift Radio. Hello, shifters, and welcome back to Real Shift Radio. I'm, of course, your host, Dominic Labriola, and I'm pleased to bring you our second episode with special guest Rosie Tran. She's an actress, a stand-up comedian, a fellow podcaster, and she even has her hands in the real estate market. I sit down with Rosie to get her insight on all of that and more. All right. Welcome, Rosie. I am so happy to have you here today. I am happy to be here. (laughs) Rosie Tran is a comedian, and most importantly, I think it's very cool that you are a real estate investor. I am. So you and I met uh, about a year ago almost at a leadership training class that I took, and we just really connected, and I'm so glad that you came here today to talk to me about real estate investment because I think that... One of the really cool things about real estate investment in your world is that it's very approachable for you. And so I'd really love to have you. We'll get into that. Yeah. (laughs) So I was hoping you could tell me more and my listeners more about yourself and and how you got to come to California and where you're from and and just give me a little background on you. Um, So I started out, I wanted to be a comedian and an actress. Um, I was really shy growing up. But I ended up getting into it kind of by accident. I had a boyfriend, ex-boyfriend that wanted to be a comedian and he encouraged me to do it. And I was so shy and I ended up just kind of trying it out on mm-hmm. his pushing. Sure. <laughs> and then we promptly broke up. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept the comedy and got rid of the ex, I guess. Sounds like it worked <laughs> out for the best. <laughs> um, but it helped me come out of my bubble and I, I learned so much from stand-up. I still do stand-up, and I also have a podcast as well, awesome. which you were a guest on. I was. <laughs> Thank and, you. And um, <clears throat> I think I just really wanted a voice. I got into stand-up. This sounds so against most the reason most people go into stand-up. Most people are like, oh, I love making people laugh, and I was always the class clown. But I got into stand-up because I wanted to be a voice. Mm-hmm. I remember I was a senior in high school, and I had to um, write this paper on Asian American stereotypes to try to get this Asian American uh, scholarship for college. Mm -hmm. And I had to do research on stereotypes. And the more research I did into Asian stereotypes, the more I realized I got to be a voice for Asian Americans because um, there was some statistic I found that was insane. Like Asian Americans have the highest rate of suicide of any ethnic minority. And it's because of the extreme pressure in our culture to be overachievers mm-hmm. and to be lawyers and doctors and, and make tons of money. And, and that was the first reason. The second reason for the high suicide rate is because we don't talk about our problems in Asian culture. Sure. <laughs> and also because um, we don't have enough positive role models in the media. Uh-huh. And so those three reasons were more than enough for me. I was like, I'm going to do something in entertainment. I'm going to do something in the media and I'm going to be that positive role model because I don't like hearing that my people are killing themselves. No, that's awful. That's awful. Yeah. And so um, I think my motivation was a little bit more altruistic than most comedians. I would say, I think a lot of comedians have the desire to make people laugh and bring joy mm-hmm. and entertain people. But I had that kind of extra, like, outside of myself reason. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I came out here uh, to Los Angeles, started doing um, comedy, started podcasting to bring my positive message. And um, along the way, real estate investing came in because I always was interested in investing. Mm -hmm. And stand-up was actually related to that, (laughs) believe it or not. (laughs) All right. Tell me how. Um, So I was running around Hollywood as a little 19, 20-year-old girl, and I noticed that most of the comedians I knew, even the ones that had extreme amounts of success, 
were very, very poor. Sure. Um, I remember having a gentleman who was on multiple television shows, pretty big celebrity, and he was asking me if he could crash on my couch. Oh, my gosh. Because he was homeless. Wow. So I had always been interested in investing in high school, but I grew up in a household that even though my parents are now into investing, as a child, my parents had a very negative view of investing. They thought the stock market was a scam. Uh Uh-huh. And they thought real estate investing was not for them. They said, you know, we don't know anything about that. Uh, we, you know, my mom, my grandparents invested in Vietnam, but the communists came and seized all their assets during the war. Oh, wow. So my parents were very anti-investing. Sure. And so anytime I talked about investing in high school, they said, you know, that's too risky. That's not for you. And they really discouraged it. Uh-huh. Um, despite the fact that my uncle is a real estate investor. And then... You know, going running around Hollywood and seeing these sometimes, I mean, I'm not even kidding, Dominic, famous people yeah. asking me for money, wow. <laughs> asking me to sleep on my couch. I thought, whoa, I don't want to be 35 years old, 40 years old no. and have, you know, success maybe in the entertainment industry, but be broke. And a lot of people don't know, sometimes these people who are celebrities on TV shows, they're not doing that well financially because they either didn't invest their income from television shows or movies. Sure. Or they had bad business managers because they put their investments in the hands of other people. Yeah. Or they um, simply have drug problems or other things where the money just goes out the door. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. (laughs) No, not at all. So tell me how you got to invest in your first property. Okay, so I uh, was about 23 or 24 years old. Mm-hmm. And I had been saving all of my money. I was working as like a waitress or something. And I also had a second job at Banana Republic. And I was doing comedy at night. And I, um, the investment principles I used were pretty basic. It was just living frugally and saving my money and investing it in mutual funds. So pretty basic stuff. Sure. And then I had saved up about, I think, twenty or $30,000 from all this. And um, I had been looking, I had really been looking for quite a while, but um, at that time, the real estate market was in the LA bubble. Uh (laughs) (laughs) And uh, a lot of my friends were actually investing in real estate at the time. And one of my friends who was a comedian who moonlit as a mortgage broker was really pushing me, pushing me. You got to get into the market. You got to get into the market. It's just, we're printing money. You buy a house. A year later, you sell it for double the money. You got to do it. You got to do it. And I was just cautious. Uh I was like, I don't think this is a good idea. (laughs) Even though the statistics for the past five years before that were showing that it was going up, 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 up. What year was this? This was, when was the height? 2006? 2006 was pretty much the height. um, And then it, it started to... Like, second home started to kind of go down near the end of 2006, 2007, and then the major crash in 2008. Okay, so it was about 2006, 2007. I was really, like, on Realtor.com every single day. Uh I don't don't know if Realtor.com's out. MLS, whatever. I was online every day looking at properties. I really, really wanted to invest. And I just call it intuition, call it just I didn't have enough money to get into the market. I just felt like It it wasn't the time. So prices started going down in 2007. I really, really was looking. And then um, I was actually in a really horrible relationship. Uh (laughs) It was a really bad, abusive relationship. And I was living with the guy. And um, we ended up breaking up. And I, even though he was living with me, and so I stayed in the apartment, I wanted like a fresh start. Yeah. And the market had begun crashing. Okay. So um, I knew... It, this was 2008. I knew it was going to go down more. I knew it wasn't bottom, but I didn't care. Yeah. Because I thought, hey, prices are, I think they were down about 30% already, uh-huh. 40%. And I found a little condo in North Hollywood that was 240 and I paid 150 for it. Wow. And Was it a short sale or... So it was a flipper. So what happened was it was a foreclosure. Okay. An investment company bought it. Uh-huh. They did a quick reno and they were just trying to get rid of it and make a quick buck. Okay. It, which I knew. Yeah. I, 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 I saw the quality of the renovation. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it wasn't that great. 
it was like they put some paint on and like cleaned it up. But it was totally livable, right? It was livable, and I didn't have to do major renovations. And I knew, I knew the market was going to go down more. Okay. I knew it was going to go down more because I just could tell by what was going on, kind of the financial panic was going on. But I didn't care. I wanted to get into a place, and I knew because it was two forty, two hundred forty thousand before that I was getting a good deal and that I would make my money back because I wasn't planning on moving in two years. Sure. So this is a property that you intended to live in and stay in for, for probably a five or six years? Five year. or six years, whatever. Okay. It's been actually like six years now, and I probably will stay in two more years okay. before I leave um, because me and my husband aren't planning to have kids or anything right now. Okay. So, um, And it's a one-bedroom, one-bath, and so I, I applied for a loan and I had good credit, decent credit and good. I had the more than the down payment, way more than the down payment and so I got in my first place. Was this a conventional mortgage or or did you utilize like an FHA mortgage or how did you how did you get into this property? I um I I I actually think that the loan that they gave me doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so um, it was considered a risky loan, but I didn't consider it risky, and I'll explain it. Okay. So they had these crazy loans. That, uh, they still have them, the ARM loans and the, and the um, interest-only loans. Okay. And today, right? So, sure. So for those of you who don't know what they are, you pay interest only for the first five years, and then the interest rate resets, and it you either switch into a conventional or whatever. Okay. But what I had was, um, it doesn't exist anymore, but I considered it very safe, and I'll explain. Um, it was a interest-only pick-a-pay. So they, they set it up like um, one of those risky loans, but my rate was locked, and then I had the option to do whatever. So there was four options every month. I could do interest-only, I could pay, it's crazy, I, this doesn't exist anymore. I could do interest only, I could pay it as a 15 year loan, I could pay it as a 30 year loan, or I could pay it, it was like I had four options every month. Sure. Yeah. So I had a property with an option arm loan like this. It was yeah. one of my properties back in Lake Havasu City. So, um, so. But I think they got rid of them because of risk um, or whatever. I think they are because the, I, I don't think they're necessarily I didn't total consider bad it risky, thing. but um, I think people were paying the interest only for like sure. years and years and years. If you do that, it's not you're good. never going to pay down your principal. And, and so, but if you, um, if you were to actually, one of the options was, I think, negative amortization. That, yeah, it was. And that's, that's something <laughs> that's I would <laughs> never recommend. So, because that was the first option. The first option was negative amortization. Second was interest only. Third was conventional 30 year. And the sec fourth option was 15 year. Sure. So the first one was like only, it was to keep you current on the loan and not uh -huh. in foreclosure, but you would add negative interest to it. Sure. So that's why they got rid of them, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah. So Do like, you still have that loan on the property or have you refinanced since? I refinanced, thank the Lord. And my payment is probably like the lowest anyone in LA pays <laughs> for anything <laughs> because I refinance it into 3.3%. Wow, yes. And my payment is like $500. We are still <laughs> experiencing some incredibly low interest rates right now even. So it's... It is. Yeah. It is. And, I, and I'm so angry because I actually called to refinance and the day before the interest rate was like 3.1 or something, but I didn't lock it in. So that would have saved me like another hundred dollars. Yeah. But I mean, my mortgage payment is the rents in my area are over fifty percent higher. They're like sixty percent. I think for one bedroom, one bath in my neighborhood is eleven $1 hundred. Wow. So you're yeah. saving tons of money by being a by property owning. owner. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I get to do whatever I want. I've redone the kitchen. I've redone the bathroom, and I have pride of ownership. Great. Which is, I feel not like I'm. A slave. Yeah. <laughs> I know that sounds horrible, but I feel like when you're paying someone rent and they're making money off of you. You're paying somebody else's mortgage. You are. <laughs> yes. You are. So I am so happy about that. Cool. So with that, have you invested in other properties since then? I have. I awesome. have. Um, I own a property um, out of state, Okay. which I would strongly encourage people to do if they can't afford their area. Okay. Um, because uh, prices in LA have rebounded quite a bit and it's kind of expensive for me to get into a rental property. Sure. So I purchased a foreclosed unit um, in another state 
Um, did you have experience with that marketplace in any way? I did because um, my parents lived there and I okay. grew up in that area. Sure. And um, there's other markets like that are still, you know, up and coming, but still more depressed. Uh, Arizona mixed, depending on what area, Las uh -huh. Vegas. And so there's still so much, even though the economy has rebounded quite a bit, there's still a lot of opportunities, I think, for people. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you face with, um, with investment property out of the area? Um, I don't think that I deal with the issues that a normal person would because m my mom actually manages the property for me. Okay. Um, per, my per her request, I actually wanted to get a property manager because I don't like mixing business with family. Family, sure. But she was like so adamant about it. <laughs> she was like, let me manage it for you. Let me manage it for you. I'm like, okay. Um, but I, I know several friends that have investment properties out of state. And I think the key is really just finding a good a property manager. Okay. Because if you have someone that, you know, isn't on top of things, obviously you're going to have a huge headache. But if yeah. you have someone that is on top of things, then basically you're just getting a check every month Yeah. and it's flawless. So I would say if someone was buying out of state, just to really, really scout and, and, and look up Yelp reviews and look up, you know, whatever reviews you can and make sure that the property manager is great. And they take a pretty small percentage sure. from the research I've done. Yeah. Okay. So part of the goal behind this podcast is to have people live a really balanced life. Yes. And, <laughs> and I think that there are a lot of factors in that for myself. I, I was hoping you could speak to me about what that means to you and, and how you go about living a life that incorporates work and play. Well, that's really important because um, I'm really passionate about investing in finance, obviously. But I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't care about money or I don't care about that because, you know, what do you just talk about money all day long or investing? Like they think that because I have an investment mindset that, you know, I never have fun or never do anything else. And I'm just like money, money, money. Sure. Right. And that's just silly. I think, you know, we both are huge fans of Robert Kiyosaki uh -huh. that you should mind your business, mm -hmm. your personal business. And that's yep. so important. And then also there's, there's life and, and play and, I'm so blessed that my stand-up and my podcasting is my passion, so a lot of times that is play for me, but also, you know, having fun, going on vacations. I'm going to Las Vegas this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't wait. <laughs> I'm so excited. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to Vegas just to, ha to have fun and, and travel. I mean, my husband loved traveling and, and, and enjoying things, and we love playing tourists. We just played tourists in L.A. the other day, which uh -huh. I don't know if you do that. It's so fun. It is. We went to the Natural History Museum, and Great. I think it's just really important to take time for yourself because I think a lot of people, um, it just sounds silly, like, well, why wouldn't you take time for yourself? But a lot of people, especially women that I know, ladies, go around with their head cut off taking care of everyone else but themselves. Uh -huh. So it's really important that my battery is charged so I can give the light that I'm meant to give sure I asked you to let me know if you have a success quote or a mantra that you live by I do I do have it but awesome. I gotta look it up on my phone because it's really long okay it's uh the Mar Marianne Williamson quote and it's from a return to love it's so long but I'll read it um okay. I love this I love 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 this um, this is the quote. Uh, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure it is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to, do, to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone and everyone. We let our own light shine. We unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. So yes. I love that because I, um, I used to do that. And I think a lot of people do mm -hmm. where I wasn't as amazing as I could be because I thought, well, what if people judge me? Well, what if they feel insecure? And it's funny how we attach they to who, yeah. who are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, it has happened actually, because the bigger your light is, I think the more people, 
some people do get intimidated, uh -huh. but that's not my responsibility. No. You know, like I've had people send me hate mail. I've had people send me, you know, put negative comments on my YouTube videos or whatever. Sure. But it's not my responsibility. If they're insecure, that's their issue. No. And so if they direct it at me, I can choose to internalize it or I can choose to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Have you had any major obstacles in your life that you've had to overcome? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Tell me all about it. <laughs> um, I think we all have had that, um, and they just manifest in different ways. And uh, I'll tell you a couple in a second, but that's why I don't like to diminish anyone. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, I'm dealing with this or that. And I've heard people say, oh, well, that's no big deal, or you'll get over it. And I always like yeah. to acknowledge people's struggle, no matter what it is, even if you're, you know, um, extremely wealthy or quote unquote privileged, because, you know, people's pain and their struggles are very real to them. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, and I, I, you know, you never know what someone's going through. There's, you know, look at Robin Williams. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, oh, he had it all. He had success. And yet he was, you know, I'm sure if Robin Williams came to someone and said, oh, I'm feeling depressed. Some people might say, well, what do you have to be depressed about, dude? You're rich, you have this, you have that. And so diminishing someone's pain is not a, not helpful because even if it doesn't seem like a lot to you, they may be going through an extreme amount of internal trauma. trauma. So I think everyone has, you know, pain, obviously. And, yeah. and no matter how silly it sounds, like someone's, someone's pain that, um, and actually the more success you have, uh, I'm going to give you another quote because I, I love this one. Jim Carrey says, I wish everyone all the financial success and fame that they ever wanted so that they can realize it doesn't mean anything wow. or it doesn't solve their problems. Yeah. And it's so true because a lot of times the more success you have, people think, oh, well, you don't have any problems. Sure. And that's not true. We all have problems, whether we're impoverished or wealthy or whatever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, growing up, I had a lot of struggles with my parents because um, I love them so much and they've provided so much, but they don't have the best emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so definitely I grew up with a lot of dysfunction and, and craziness in my household. My, you know, my dad has a crazy temper and yeah. um, he never really let us express ourselves and express who we were. And my mom is, is all about image and she's just, you know, didn't really want us to shine our light maybe as bright as we should have for fear sure. of judgment. So yeah. I think that's where I learned that from. Yeah. Yeah. How did you work through having that kind of a, a model to, to really become successful in, in being very genuine and, and letting your, your true self really show? Because I feel like you really are a genuine person and oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Dominic. <laughs> um, I think that it was a struggle. It was a constant struggle. I always felt like something was off. I remember in high school just feeling like there's something off. There's just something off. And every, every time I was authentic, I felt like it was kind of shut down yeah. by myself and by society. Because, you know, a lot of people say, I've heard people say, oh, well, I feel depressed and I don't know. I just don't know why. Oh, a lot of women, oh, I must be on my period. No, our, the way our society in general, the mainstream is set up, is not really for the development of people in a healthy way. You know, we're really taught to, to be sheeple in a way. Sure. Which is sheep people. For those of you who didn't get what I was talking about. Um, and to conform. And, and the irony of that whole situation is the people who are the most successful in this world are people who don't conform. Yeah. You know, the Bill Gateses, the, you know, um, the, the Ted Turners, the, even Henry Ford. Yeah. People who are the trailblazers, the true trailblazers of society and that make history, the Martin Luther Kings. Yeah. You know, they are people who are like, wait a minute. And I don't understand why people keep repeating the same problems over and over because it happens every generation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a status quo and there's someone trying to break that status quo and then people get all upset. So I don't understand when new people come to break the status quo, why people still get upset because it's like there was a time when, you know, you couldn't drink from the same water fountain and that was considered. Okay. Okay. And that was considered, you know, don't, don't talk about equality that's just wrong and and there was a time you know when it was considered okay to send people to special camps to fix their sexuality Crazy. or to you know 
fix their morality or whatever, and electric shock therapy was used, and all these things. This was like 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and now we look back and we go, wow, what was wrong with us back then? <laughs> and so I don't understand why when people question things now, it's a constant, um, well, we, we shouldn't talk about that or we shouldn't question that. Or we, it's like, why not? Like, haven't we learned from history? The more we talk and question and, and let things out. So for me... Less like we are to repeat it. To repeat it, exactly. <laughs> so, so for me, it was just this constant feeling of there's something not right. There's, there's something else out there. There's something else out there. Yeah. And that's where my ferocious um, desire for more information and, and, and search for knowledge came from. Uh-huh. And I, I just finished Kiyosaki's um, Retire Rich, Retire Young. Have you read that? I haven't read that one yet. And I love it because a lot of people criticize Robert Kiyosaki, He's, who is a, um, a finance guy that Dominic and I both like, because he, he some of his books are a bit vague, and this one was very vague, but I loved it because he doesn't talk about how to get rich. He talks about how to change your thinking. Mm-hmm. to get rich. And so that is more important, I think, than anything, is changing your mindset. And sure. so I think that because I grew up in a very restrictive household, I, I my mind was like, no, yeah, <laughs> this isn't normal. <laughs> no. That segues into the next question I was actually going to ask you. Um, do you have any daily practices like meditation or anything that really help you with your mindset? Or or what do you, what's your daily practice? What so I do, do, do meditation, but I'm not as um, rigorous as okay. I should be. So I don't do it daily. I, I would say maybe two or three times a week. What is meditation for you? What, I mean, there's so many different ways there are, to yeah, do it. There are so, so many different ways. What I do is I sit in a quiet place, and I, I focus on my breathing. And then a bunch of manic thoughts pop up in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it and worries and concerns and thoughts. And then I practice letting them go. Uh-huh. And I, um, this is what I recently started doing, which is very, very, very helpful. People try this out for like two weeks and it will change your life. Um, I, so th- that's the first part of the meditation, which lasts about three to five minutes. And then for the last five to 10 minutes, I will repeat a positive mantra to myself. So uh-huh. I'll say something like, I am love. And I'll just say it over and over in my mind. Yeah. I'll say, I am love. I am love. I am love. I am joy. And then I'll, feel myself experiencing joy mm-hmm. as I, I'll practice creating the emotion of joy inside my body. Yeah. And I'll do that, but I'll, of course, only say positive things. <laughs> Great. I love it. Yes, and it's very helpful. And I also try to catch myself as much as I can. I've gotten better, and that's why me and my husband's fights have gone down. <laughs> um, I try to catch myself when I, when I feel myself reacting mm-hmm. or being negative or being self-righteous. Anytime I feel like my ego is in charge and not me, uh-huh. I try to stop and say, whoa, what's going on here? Somebody shared that we should be responsive, not reactive. Yeah, that's and great. And I love that. <laughs> I think that it really, it really landed for me because so much of what I... I guess so much of our day can be reactionary. and Oh, yeah. And so... Being thoughtful and sometimes just taking a break and and really planning what you respond with can really make great strides and help help you out. I know it helps me out. So it does, and I've I've been practicing compassion and empathy, which is really 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 hard. <laughs> um, it's actually really really easy, with, obviously, with people who are easy to deal with, but it's sure. when you're dealing with those really difficult people. Yeah. That the compassion and the empathy are just so important because, um, and I get mad sometimes, you know, I get mad. Like I, I was dealing with someone who was very, very, de- very difficult mm-hmm. and I went home and I told my um, husband, I said, you know what? It just, it's awful because why do I have to be the compassionate one? Like, well, how come they're not compassionate towards me, but I have to be compassionate towards them. Yeah. And the rule of thumb is in, in personal development thinking is whoever has the higher consciousness level has the responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I know, but I just want someone to be compassionate towards <laughs> me. Like, come on, why can't I just be a total baby and they get to do work on themselves? But that's not our mission here. No. Our mission here is that we are responsible for ourselves. Yeah. And so I got to process, which is what I call working stuff out inside of myself, dealing with this very, very difficult person and seeing them in a loving way and seeing uh-huh. that they're not, I guess 
that they kind of don't know any better because obviously if someone knew they were being that difficult, yeah. I don't think that they would purposely try to do it unless they were severely mentally ill. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure as a, a realtor, and sometimes maybe you have difficult clients or you've dealt with people yeah. that you're just like, it can happen. Are you kidding me? I, <laughs> Is this for real? <laughs> in the last couple years, especially, I've really changed um, my mindset in in the kind of people that I work with. And I've really defined... 20 rule? Getting rid I've of de- that? I've defined who my <laughs> ideal client is and the kind of people that I want to work with. And I, the president of our company, Nick Siegel, has a, a quote that I think really applies. It's, a, at the moment of discernment and, and creating, crafting the ideal image of who you want to work with, that's when those kinds of people begin to enter your life. That's so, true. That's so true. I think just being aware of that has been really helpful for me. And it feels like all of a sudden the kind of people that I want to be around are just coming at me left and right. That's true. And also when you're really present to that, hey, puppy, <laughs> um, I'm being licked by a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is in the studio with us right now. so <laughs> The co-host of the podcast. Um, I also noticed, too, that when you're really present to those those abilities, not only do you attract those people, but you can also avoid the people that you don't want to. Because if you're just running your, your real estate practice or, or business, like, hey, I'm desperate, I'll take any client, sure. you're going to get any client. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but if you meet, you know, but if you're present and aware to that, I think if there's certain clients that you maybe can tell are going to be high maintenance at first, yeah. you can kind of do some, uh, what is it, like pre- I don't like screening. <laughs> uh, what is it? Um, defensive playing on the field. Uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> I think setting expectations and, and telling people how I work. I, I feel like water kind of seeks its own level. Mm-hmm. And so true. I really feel like more than ever, the kinds of people that I want to work with find me because of that. So it's pretty cool. That is cool. I wanted to mention something because you had asked me about real estate investing and Uh I I, I told you this off the air, but I didn't say it on the air. So I want people to know. For those of you who know, who don't know and think the entertainment industry is so glamorous, um, real estate investing is, is an option for anyone, literally anyone. I know you talked about financing and we talked about that, but I really want you guys to know there are years that I have made, I'll I'll tell you guys my, my income range. My income range has been literally there's years I've made $10,000 that year to $60,000. So far, I have not made that more than that in the entertainment industry. I've done, and I've done pretty well. I've been on a bunch of TV shows and, and things, and I've gotten residuals and been on commercials. Um, so that is not like a crazy amount of money. Especially not in Los Angeles. <laughs> not, so. in, not in an LA. And the fact that I own two properties, one free and clear, um, which I actually did not want to buy that one free and clear. I wanted to get a loan and use leverage and not tie up my cash, but it was... A situation where me going in all cash Mm -hmm. gave me a better deal. Sure. Uh, So I did um, because I got the second property that I own um, actually for $50,000. Sure. (laughs) I'll tell you guys right now how cheap it was because I'm really proud of myself. And it was a property that the the comparables in the neighborhood were $110,000. Wow. So you have tons of equity already. Yes. So I wanted to go in all cash. So, But I just want you guys to know that it's not... I'm not like this Hollywood girl who's making, you know, uh, six figures a year or, you know, $2 million an episode or something. And that it's possible. There are, I think that the year that I bought my place, I was, you know, a 20,000 a year, but I had good credit and I had a huge down payment. Sure. So you've been saving, you had. Yeah. So just so you guys know, it's totally doable on any income level, literally. I think it's really just about a mindset and it's totally about a mindset <laughs> that you uh, setting your intention and, and putting that you wanted to own property. And so you, you figured out how to make it happen. So. I did figure out how to make it happen and I didn't go crazy. You know, some people want the Beverly Hills, you know, condo. Well, you can't afford the Beverly Hills condo Sure, and that's okay. But I'm building up. I plan to be in a way nicer area in a way nicer property in five to ten years, mm-hmm. you know, as my forever home. Yeah. But for me to get in 
when I did get in, mm -hmm. instead of renting, yeah. is allowing me to have that forever home mm -hmm. in the future. Because like you said, I'm saving, you know, over 60% in rent every month. Amazing. And I'm building equity. Yeah. Which, you know, there's, um, I don't know, have you read The Richest Man in Babylon? Mm -hmm. Yes. So for those of you who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my nightstand right now. I'm revisiting it. <laughs> um, there's a, it's a parables or what would it be considered? Yeah, I think it could potentially be a parable. It's uh, kind of like Aesop's fables, but like about money, right? Yeah. And one of the the um, things that they say is always a rich man always owns his own property. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because you're not paying someone else. <laughs> yep. Do you use any applications or or like websites to track your money or how? I how, do. I use Mint.com. Oh, Mint. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Mint. <laughs> I use Mint, and I also personally handle all of my money. Not that I make so much money that I need a business manager. But um, I just mentioned this on my podcast, actually. Um, Oprah said she signs all of her checks personally, and she mm -hmm. always oversees all of her finances, no matter how much or how, or how little she's made over the years, because um, it's important to her. Joan Rivers does that. And a lot of people, I think especially in Hollywood, think, oh, well, you know, I don't know about money now and I won't need to know about money when I make it because I'll just hire a business manager. Well, sometimes a business manager is still money. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and it's okay to have a really great business manager if you know the basics. Yeah. So it's just like, you know, I guess being a general contractor, you don't have to do all the work yourself. You can subcontract out. Sure. But general co contractors always know how to do everything yeah. before they subcontract it out. So see if people are doing it right. Yep. So it's okay to have a business manager if you yourself first know the basics of finance. Yeah. You can't, you know, because then you won't be able to take, get taken advantage of. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about who you surround yourself with and how the people that you have in your life support you in your mission. Okay. This is so important. <laughs> so, so important because what is it? You're the average or the of the people you hang out with or something? I think that's yeah. the quote. You're the, and so um, unfortunately, there's some people in your life that you're forced to hang out with, whether because of being related to them or whatever reason. So that kind of lowers your average. So you better get some higher averages in there. <laughs> <laughs> the people that you can choose, yeah. right? <laughs> um, I'm not where I want to be with it. I would, ideally, I would love to be the dumbest person that I hang out with. <laughs> You're the second person to tell me that. Day, so. <laughs> because you never want to be, you never want to be the smartest person in the room. That is all ego. You know, if you're the smartest person in the room, great. You're the smartest person in the room. What are you going to learn? Yeah. Right. What are you going to learn? Nothing, because you're the smartest person. So you, I, I always look up. Mm -hmm. You know, my husband is amazing. Um, I kind of thought we were at the same level when we got married, but I'm starting to think he is above me but doesn't know he's above me. <laughs> he's smarter me. than you gave him credit for. <laughs> I think he's above me but he doesn't know he's above me. <laughs> Which is good, right? <laughs> you get a 10 but they don't know they're a 10. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, he's super, super smart in different ways than I am. And so that compliments us because he is smart in a very technical way. He's very smart. He's very smart in a different way than I am and we're both creative in a different way. He is a musician as well. Mm. And I have no musical abilities. <laughs> so so we, we are never, even though I don't believe in competition, but we never have that feeling of competition. Sure. We have a feeling of complimenting. So he, I'm probably with him the most. He's my best friend. Um, I have other friends that kind of, we have a similar relationship as me and my husband. You know, my yeah. best friend, Ashley, she's like my support, my rock. She's so amazing and very loving, and she brings a different insight. So I kind of surround myself with people who bring a different strength than I have. Yeah. And 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 I also tend to want to spend time with like-minded people. Mm -hmm. You know, my ex-neighbors who um, are also into investing, uh, I hang out with them a lot, and they, they have a different perspective. It's not the same perspective. In fact, sure. their ideas about investing are totally different than mine. Mm -hmm. They're against using leverage. They have a very traditional pay down debt, you know, mm -hmm. safe way of investing. But the fact that they're on that wavelength of financial freedom, I think is important. Yeah. And just surrounding yourself, even if they have different viewpoints, but people that have, um, I guess the same vibrational level as you, they're thinking on that same level. Okay. It's so important because, 
you know, there was a time maybe three, four years ago where I was hanging out with people that were, I'm going to say lower vibration, sure. <laughs> or a different vibrational plane. Maybe that's nicer. Uh -huh. And the results I was creating in my life were a lot crappier. Sure. Yeah. Okay. A lot of shallow friendships, a lot of, you know, movie and shopping mall friends. <laughs> It makes sense. <laughs> and so you don't have to get rid of all of your friends, but once you start getting, I guess, interested in certain things, certain people will kind of fall away. And it's weird because one of my friends that I thought was one of my best friends, you know, she, it was a very shallow friendship. And I thought, oh, well, you know, how am I going to break this off with her? I really don't want to spend that much time with her anymore. I kind of just stopped calling her and she fell, fell off. She stopped calling you too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> have you had that experience? I, I definitely <laughs> have. I think that, um, I don't know. I, I think people, I can appreciate those relationships for what they were at the time. And, but I definitely feel like people have been in my life for different reasons. And um, sometimes just to teach you what you don't want to. Be. Sure. <laughs> like not in a bad way, like they're awful, but you're like, I kind of don't want to go drinking and partying every night. Like yeah. that's not that fun. <laughs> Overall, I feel like I'm, I'm kind of someone who builds pretty lifelong friendships. Like I still have friends from when we were four or five years old and one of them just came with his daughter and his fiance to, um, to visit. And we went to Legoland with his daughter and we've been friends since we were seven. I can so and imagine you at Legoland. <laughs> <it was awesome. laughs> I have to tell you. So it, it's just neat to be able to still have those friendships be there. Um, but then there are relationships that have fallen away recently that, that haven't really supported me in the type of person that I want to be or um, their mindset wasn't really Supportive, in line yeah. with, with like the way that I want to approach the rest of the world. And, and so it's been helpful to kind of let those relationships go. And it is, and it's crazy because you'll just start attracting people. And, you know, I've been attracting so many people lately that are just positive and mm -hmm. supportive. And, and I, you know, I've always had the mindset that no bad things happen because all of the quote unquote bad things that happen to us are here for us to learn a lesson or for our mm -hmm. spiritual awakening or whatever you want to call it, whether you're religious or not. And it's kind of just what we're attaching the well, idea kind of, of bad yeah. to. And, and I think that I used to say that a lot and I didn't, I, I think I did it as a coping mechanism to deal with some of the bad things in my life. Like, Oh, there's a meaning for this. Something good's going to come out of it. But I'm really seeing the good unfold now uh -huh. from some of the bad things that happened to me even 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, one of my ex-boyfriends who was just horribly abusive in every way you can imagine, and mm -hmm. I just had so much anger and resentment towards him that he was just a horrible person and everything. You know, looking back, he did teach me a lot about what I didn't want. Yeah. You know, he, he taught me a lot about um, having unhealthy boundaries, and so now I have very healthy boundaries uh -huh. with people. He taught me a lot. It's like sometimes you learn a lot of stuff from really bad situations. Yeah. And now that there's space from it, because we've been apart for so many years, mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Like, oh, he taught me a lot about what I don't want. And that's mm. almost as important as knowing what you do want, because, you know, just like yin and yang, you need to know both. Yeah. You know? So I Definitely. think, yeah, bad stuff is good stuff. Yes. <laughs> that's my quote. Bad <laughs> stuff is good stuff. <laughs> Have you had any influential mentors in, I guess, first of all, just in, in like the business world um, with, with your, your quote unquote, like, I, I guess real estate investment really is kind of probably as much of a, a financial income for you as, as your, your job as a comedian and podcaster. So I do. Um, I made about. 14,000 last year in residual income, mm -hmm. which is about half of my income. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, who has shaped your, who have you followed and, and who's kind of helped you to guide you in and be your mentor? So I have read pretty much every single finance book, Dave Ramsey, Kiyosaki, like you said, Richest Man in Babylon. I, re I read so many personal development books. 
I've read, you know, and if you just go to the personal development section and pick on something, and a lot of them are very, very, very similar. Um, but I did have a personal mentor who was a gentleman I met um, <clears throat> when I was doing a, a life coaching program with the program that we met, mm -hmm. uh, where we, you and I met, the leadership program. And he um, was a, a, a gentleman who owned... Um, three businesses, mm -hmm. you know, he ha I think he had a net worth of $5 million. And he, he definitely taught me a lot. I didn't, you know, I don't talk with him that much just because he's very, very busy. He runs three businesses, like I said, yeah. but he, I would talk to him a lot about my ideas and, and investing in other things. And he, just as someone who was a pretty successful, you know, not wildly successful, he wasn't worth a hundred million dollars, but I mean, $5 million is a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he had done real estate investing and flipping and also had um, a day spa in Santa Monica. And he just kind of, <clears throat> I guess, even though he kind of just told me what I had read in a lot of the books, he explained it to me and kind of showed it to me in real life applications. Uh -huh. So it wasn't just an idea in a book. It was like a 3D concept Very that came tangible. to life. Yeah, it came to life for me. And, it, and what it showed me was that um, and Kiyosaki just said this. I'm just saying this because I just finished this book, so a lot of it's in my mind. He says, money is just energy. It's not, it's not real. Yeah. It's just an idea. Mm -hmm. I think he says money is an idea. And so people who live in poverty consciousness, it's just a thought. Like, mm -hmm. it's so crazy. But the more and more I hang out with really successful and, and wealthy people, it's like a game to them. And that, that sounds kind of demeaning when you're really struggling to pay the bills and you're really struggling for money, but it's like once you master the game, it's like not a big deal. Yeah. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. <laughs> and so you just take a lot of attachment away from it. Like I'm so not desperate for money the way I was before. Uh huh. Like I, I'm not controlled by it. Yeah. Even though I probably read more about money now and investing in this and that, I'm not as... Like, it doesn't have power over me mm -hmm. because I know that it's not real and that I will always be able to create it even if I have no means of getting a paycheck. Something that's been very helpful for me <laughs> that is <makes> sense. <laughs> realizing that, like, my fears about it are totally unfounded, too. They're like, fake. They're totally fake. You know, <laughs> our fears are like, oh, my God, well, if I do this, then I'm not going to have money and they'll be homeless. No, you're not going to be homeless. Nobody's <laughs> None of the people that love you are going to let you be Nobody homeless. Nobody that... So. And, and I've heard that from people. Oh, well, if I lose my job and I'll be homeless. There is a homeless population, but most of them have suffered from severe mental illness. Sure. And, or drug addiction. Yeah. So unless you have those, like, you probably chances are will never be homeless. not very yeah. good. <laughs> and we live in a developed country, so being homeless here isn't even that bad, actually. <laughs> they have better views in Santa Monica than we do. <laughs> um, so. It's true, because homelessness in some of the third world is... is awful yeah. it's truly truly awful but it, yeah he helped me to he was a mentor in i don't even think he knew who's mentor to me because he just thought we were having lunches i think <laughs> but i think that can be really valuable i think um one of the things i learned about mentorship is that i have a lot of different mentors and they don't even have to know that oh he doesn't know who's you. a mentor <laughs> yeah and and that's okay they i mean I think a lot of people are really afraid of like, I need to get a mentor. Who's going to be my mentor? And You just kind of pick someone that you look up to. And like I said, I would just buy him lunch. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, hey, can I pick your brain? Yeah. And after picking his brain a bunch, I, I consider him a mentor. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he kind of made, explained to me the game of money, that it was just a game. Mm -hmm. And it's just like Monopoly and it's very simple and people overcomplicate it by putting all these attachments to it, like you said. Yeah. Fears and worries and emotional attachments. And that's why a lot of spending is emotional spending and that's why it's just like, you know, if you're overweight and you do emotional eating, it's yeah. just it's all psychological. It's money is not real. It's just a pieces of paper that we put meaning and value and sure. It's just a game. So one now that I've learned how to play the game, even though I haven't won the game, I feel like I have a good hand. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah. You know, a good hand of cards. <laughs> what excites you every day? Honestly, this sounds so cheesy, but uh, I have a plan to get out of the rat race, which I'm pretty much out of, but uh, I have a specific goal um, to just 
not even worry about a dollar ever again. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty close to my goal. <laughs> so that's where your passive income overcomes what you spend on a daily basis. Um, it does, but right now, as part of my plan, I've been living extremely frugally for the past seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. And so um, encompassed with that would be to um, have a higher standard of living. Uh-huh. Yeah. Sure. Because I've been living like a college kid a little bit past college. <laughs> <laughs> but it's afforded me to be able to buy an investment property, and I'm looking to either buy a business or a multi-unit. Okay. So I am... I've been looking at businesses online and, and um, what is it called? Absentee owner businesses uh -huh. where, or semi absentee owner businesses where there's either a manager there or the business is running without an owner needing to be there. Yeah. Okay. Something that I really think about often is what my burning desire is. And I was wondering if you have your burning desire and, and what that is. I do. Um, my burning desire is to really, really make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Um, if I had known half of the stuff that I learned in my twenties when just as a kid, mm -hmm. when we should be learning this stuff, I feel like I would be just, you know, mountains and mountains ahead. And I think that a lot of this important stuff is not taught in school, you know, finance, emotional development, mentorship, all these things. Mm -hmm. Mentorship with, you know, real people who can make a difference, not, you know, I know sometimes we have boys and girls, big sisters and little sisters, and I know that those programs are amazing, but I mean, I think kids need to learn the important stuff, you mm -hmm. know, like the real important stuff. Like, uh, and I, I know some math and science teachers might get mad at me, but there are some things in life some career paths and other things where you don't use math and science. Sure. But everyone needs to know the basics of money and investing, and everyone needs to know about emotional intelligence, and everyone needs to know about relationship building and, mm -hmm. and hanging out with people that are, you know, um, could it help you grow and learn. Like, these are important real-life things, and they're not taught. And so I just want to spread the word and make a difference and, and hopefully inspire people and help them to learn and grow about themselves because that's what we're here for. Yeah is to help others. So that's what's, what I'm passionate about. <laughs> what's your vision of the world then? Oh my gosh. Do you have another five hours? <laughs> <laughs> um, where to start? <laughs> you got to narrow that down a little bit, Dominic. <laughs> How do you see people using your burning desire and what you're looking to create out of the world? How, how does that picture, what does that picture look like for you? Um, I would love for people to take the information that I, I put out there and improve their lives in some way. Yeah. That's my vision. I want people to not just like listen to, you know, my podcast in the car or, or follow me online or whatever. I, I genuinely want people to become better. Yeah. I, you know, without some of the people out there that wrote the books that they wrote and put out the information that they put out, I would not be on my path to financial freedom. Sure. You know? Without, without the positive role models that are out there, I wouldn't. It, regardless of whether these people are famous or successful or not, they in some way affected me, whether I know it or not, to mm -hmm. be a better person. So I just want to have somebody listen to what I'm saying and say, "Hey, maybe I should look up personal development workshops, or maybe I should learn about investing, mm -hmm. and in some way improve their life." That's all I care about because I feel like there are so many negative people out there and I think the positive people are st and, and loving and, and caring and giving people are we're starting to um, have a domino effect uh -huh. and there's a I think there's a revolution and I think the internet's helping a lot I think so too with this revolution of just changing the old way of thinking and getting rid of all this you know these old thoughts that don't serve us as humanity anymore yeah and so I want to be part of the vibrational level that is the new thoughts that help people in and get out of this, you know, caveman thinking because there's unfortunately still people who have these outdated thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to thank you for the work that you do and I want to acknowledge you for the good that you are creating and and the model that you're being for people. I think that it's really awesome what you're putting together and I also really want to thank you for helping 
people see that real estate investment is something that anybody can do and yes, you don't literally, have to be anybody <laughs> you don't have to be rich to create financial freedom and um and you to to get started you just you just have to make the conscious effort to do that and i think you're yeah. an awesome example of that so thank you that thank is you. the first step for sure is just changing your mindset but not only i want to make it very clear not only that you have not don't have to be rich to invest in real estate. You don't even have to be middle class. I think there was a couple of years there where according to my income level, I was below the poverty line. Sure. So to say, you know, that you have to, don't have to be rich, you don't have to have any specific income level. As long as you make that choice, mm -hmm. you will find a way. Yeah. You will find a way to invest. You will find, it doesn't have to be in your city. It doesn't even have to be in your county. Mm hmm you will find a way to invest in real estate and become a property owner and it, it's it's possible if my uncle can do it on twenty thousand a year anyone can do it yeah yeah where can our listeners connect with you online oh great um you guys can find me on twitter at funny rosie and my podcast is out of the box with rosie tran it's on awesome. stitcher and itunes and soundcloud i and will link to that in our show notes on this yeah show. And, and you guys can follow me online and i'm always posting positive stuff and um, do you have a Facebook page where people can connect with you? I do. It's facebook.com slash funny Rosie. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Yay. Well, I am so thankful for you coming to visit me and talk with me. And I really appreciate you. I am so happy to be a guest and guys just keep being positive and keep searching for more knowledge and information because that is what is going to help you. Thank you, Rosie Tran, and thank you, listeners, for staying with us here on Real Shift Radio. As always, be sure to visit the show notes at dialdominic.com slash two to find out how you can connect with Rosie and, of course, with me, your host, Dominic Labriola. Connect with me on Instagram at dialdominic. Leave me reviews and messages on iTunes and share these episodes to help spread the word through Facebook and Twitter. Let's share these positive messages and make a difference. Shifters, next week I sit down with health and wellness guru and lifestyle leader Joanna Burks. Joanna talks to us about her own shift from a successful real estate development career to one in fitness and nutrition, and how she still uses those tools in her business today. It should be an enlightening discussion. Until then, keep it real. 